Islam in America first flourished thanks to a man who changed his name, from Robert Poole to Elijah Muhammad. He was a poor laborer who left the cotton fields of Georgia for Detroit. In the 1930s, Detroit and other northern cities were the promised land for poor southern blacks seeking jobs and new lives. It was here that Elijah Muhammad believed he met Allah in the form of a man. Just one likeness of this Arab man remains. He apparently went by the name of Master Farad Muhammad, and he persuaded Elijah to create a new religion in which black men were God's divine people. Elijah wrote his own holy text, the message to the black man in America, using references from the Quran, but also from the Bible. He wrote that Allah himself had told him that over 6,000 years ago, the white race was created by a crazy black chemist. Caucasians, especially those with pale skin and blue eyes, were the devil itself. He preached that blacks should have pride in their race. He forbade alcohol and drugs and urged fathers to support their families. White America is doomed, he wrote, soon to be destroyed by a huge spaceship, the mother of planes, which carries flying saucers and will drop bombs that fall one mile into the earth before exploding. His creed was a hodgepodge of folklore and superstition, but he built up what would become the nation of Islam using the language and rhetoric of the Muslim faith. In 1955, when Elijah Muhammad visited the New York Temple, it was to inspect the work of the ambitious and outspoken young minister who had transformed tiny storefronts along the East Coast into a congregation of thousands. Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad's message made a whole lot of people feel whole again, human being again. Some of them came out and found a new meaning to their manhood and their womanhood. Had Elijah Muhammad tried to introduce an orthodox form of Arab-oriented Islam, I doubt if he would have attracted 500 people. But he introduced a form of Islam that could communicate with the people he had to deal with. He was the king to those who had no king. He was the messiah to those some people thought unworthy of a messiah. The teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is like uh, nothing I have ever taken. It's a medicine. Right. You see, right. it's a medicine that has cured me of all my ears. Yes, Because I was a sick oh, yeah. man. That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. when I embraced the teachings of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, these teachings cured me of these ears. Right. I'm a well man now. Right. And I yeah. feel good. That's right. As long as you stay with the doctor, you continue to Yes, sir. Good. Yes, right. sir. What about you, brother? How do you feel about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Honorable Elijah Muhammad is trying to teach all our original people they are in bad shape. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. I'm with Elijah Muhammad trying to wake him up. Inside Muslim temples, no white people were allowed. Members worked to build a self-sufficient community, founded on strict rules and absolute obedience. The nation set up Muslim schools for its children, teaching mathematics, science, history and Arabic. Who is the original man? The original man is the Asian black man. The makers of the arms of the queen of the planet Earth. Muslim women studied nutrition, child rearing, and guidelines on how to care for their husbands. Muslim men studied parental responsibility, history, and religion. The elite core 
called the Fruit of Islam, was trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat and was expected to protect the temples and to punish any members who spoke out against the messenger. I went with Malcolm X in 1954. At that time, I could not even get a black professional to go to a meeting with me on 116th Street to meet with Malcolm. I do not criticize them. I, that I'm trying to assess for you the time. Yes, 1954. If you were a lawyer in 1954, uh, you were seen identifying with Malcolm X. That was not a healthy thing. Only one person did that, that my brother would go with me. Uh, we went together. Uh, the climate was bad. And there was much talk of revolution. But the black nationalists who on her, I used to get in trouble, a lot of trouble with them for being with the NACP. And I remember how happy I was to go with Malcolm. Uh, and I was able to do it because of the climate of my family background. You see, the Communist Party uh, uh, moves around, and people <laughs> say the, uh, the first is son, that's John's son, that's Jay's brother, that's Lee's brother. You've got to look out for them. I charge the white man with being the greatest robber on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest deceiver on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest troublemaker on earth. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you, bring back a verdict of guilty as charged. The indictment you have just heard is being delivered over and over again in most of the major cities across the country. This charge comes at the climax of a morality play called The Trial. The plot, indeed the message of the play, is that the white man has been put on trial for his sins against the black man. He has been found guilty. The sentence is death. The play is sponsored, produced, by a Negro religious group who call themselves the Muslims. They use a good deal of the paraphernalia of the traditional religion of Islam, but they are fervently disavowed by Orthodox Muslims. These homegrown Negro American Muslims are the most powerful of the black supremacist groups. They now claim a membership of at least a quarter of a million Negroes. Their doctrine is being taught in 50 cities across the nation. Let no one underestimate the Muslims. Following this speech, which lasted some two hours, Newsbeat reporter Louis Lomax interviewed Elijah Muhammad, the spiritual leader of the Muslims. Although you have said that the white race is doomed and that they are a race of devils, do you make any distinction? Are there any good white people? For example, suppose I were to ask you who you think is the best white man. Is there any such thing? I let the Bible answer that. He says, no, not one is good. Now, if I have understood your teachings correctly, you teach that all of the members of Islam are God, and that one among you is supreme, and that that one is Allah. Now, have I understood you correctly? That's right. Now, you have on the other hand said that Allah has taught you that the devil is the white man, that yes. the white man is a doomed race. Yes. Am I correct there? Sir? Yes. Now you have said, sir, that between now and approximately 1970, there should come a reawakening a resurrection. of the American Negro, That's right. and that the extended time for the white man uh, may well run out, and that that will come and in terms of a war between God and the devil. But of even more interest to New Yorkers is Malcolm X, the Muslim's New York minister. He is a remarkable man, a man who by his own admission was once a procurer and peddler. He served time for robbery, 
in the Michigan and Massachusetts state penitentiaries. But now he's a changed man. He will not smoke or drink. He will not even eat in a restaurant that houses a tavern. He told Newsbeat that his life changed for him when the Muslim faith taught him no longer to be ashamed of being a black man. Reporter Lewis Lomax asked Minister Malcolm X to further explain the Muslim teachings of Elijah Muhammad. That in the same context that Mr. Elijah Muhammad teaches that <clears throat> uh, his faith, that uh, the Islamic faith is for the black man and that the black man is good. He also uses the Old Testament instance of the serpent and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and he uh, sets up the proposition there that this is the great battle between good and evil and he uses the phrase devils. Yes. And he uses it almost interchangeably and synonymous with the word Now, Now what does he mean there? Well, number one, he teaches us that uh, that never was a real serpent. It was not a real serpent that went into the garden. What was it? But as you know, the Bible is written in symbols and parables, and this serpent or snake is a symbol that's used to hide the real identity of the one whom that actually was. Well, who was it? The white man. In Brooklyn, New York, black and Latino parents challenged the established order working within the system. They demanded the power to run their neighborhood schools to improve their children's future. The children are ready to work. They come to school to work. And when they get to school, the teachers, they don't know what to do. The first thing they say, we don't understand the children. Well, they will try to understand the children. These problems won't exist. The children are not stupid. They know, they know when the teachers are there to help them. Well, when my uh, family moved here from Birmingham in 1965, they came from totally segregated schools. Uh, the children were all black, the teachers were all black, the, black, the principals were all black. Uh, one of my sons was above the national average in mathematics. But when he came to the schools here in uh, Brooklyn, within one year, he was flunking math, and I went to the school to find out why. The teacher said my son was doing fine. I said, he's not bringing home assignments, and he's flunking math, and he came here from Alabama, and he was ahead of the national average, and you're telling me he's doing fine. Something is wrong. In New York City, only half of the children in black and Latino neighborhoods finished high school. To make the schools work for their children, Parents in the Ocean Hill-Brownsville section of Brooklyn planned to take charge. In the beginning, city officials were hopeful. This decentralization plan does for our city schools in New York exactly what any stable, good uh, school in any suburb has, which is to involve the parents uh, sufficiently so they have a stake in the, in the, the whole process of schools. And uh, that's all we seek to do. In 1967, with support from the Ford Foundation, the city made Ocean Hill-Brownsville an experimental district. the cultural flat feet of the FBI were on the warpath. It was becoming difficult for the American government openly to support abstract expressionist painters with a left-wing past. The FBI and the political right wing saw these painters and their work as subversive, even treasonous. The solution was to go covert, not a difficult reflex for the CIA. 
Well, of course, one feature of doing it covertly is that the administration, the executive branch, could make the decision and do it. I mean, and it makes it a lot easier than the kind of debate that would occur in, with the Congress and every every opinion uh, element in the country on everything, including some of the very retrograde people who say, no, you can't support those kinds of people. They're terrible. They're softies. They're, they're soft on communism and all the rest of it. So what America got was the formation of an unofficial hidden arts council, a consortium which consisted of the cultural elite, the museum directors, the philanthropists, the urbane millionaires, the entrepreneurs, the critics, magazine editors, and CIA personnel. Exclusive clubs and bars were where members of the consortium did business. One of the network's leading lights was John McCloy, a former OSS agent and one of the architects of the CIA. He later had a key position on the Ford Foundation, a hugely rich charitable trust. At the same time, McCloy is chairman of the Ford Foundation, and uh, according to records found in the Ford Foundation's own archives, you, you can see that uh, early in the 50s, the foundation uh, was approached repeatedly by the CIA to uh, help them provide cover for operations that they wanted to fund overseas. But existing foundations like Ford had their limitations. They were bureaucratic, and officially at least entirely independent of the CIA. Over large dinners and ice-cold martinis, the agency's old-school ties met to discuss more flexible ways of funding. Why not create new foundations if the existing ones were a pain? We would go to somebody in New York who was a, a well-known rich person and we would say we want to set up a foundation and we want we would tell him what we were trying to do and pledge him to secrecy and he would say of course uh, I'll do it and uh, then you would publish a, a letterhead and his name would be on it and there would be the foundation. <laughs> it, was a, it was really a pretty simple device. In this way, the CIA set up a huge network of phony foundations. One, for instance, was the Farfield. The Farfield Foundation was a, a CIA foundation, and there were many such. And we used uh, foundations for... We used the names of foundations for many purposes, but the foundation didn't exist except on paper. John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Mr. Muhammad had his son call Malcolm. He said, Brother Minister Malcolm, my father told me to tell you, and we're calling all over the country, that John F. Kennedy was assassinated and that we should not say anything in a derogatory way whatsoever because the man is the president of the United States and that people love him. The Muslims had scheduled a rally at the Manhattan Center in New York City. The day of the rally, the messenger called Malcolm to remind him to teach the spiritual side and avoid saying anything about the president's death. But he was clearly nervous about what he might say. He spoke from a prepared speech, um, never specifically mentioned Kennedy. Um, but then, as if courting disaster, uh, he opened the floor up to questions. 
Normally he would speak, but he wouldn't ask no answer no ask for question and answer. But this day he asked for question and answer. And he went into this litany, um, comparing other leaders around the world um, who had somehow suffered at the hands of the United States government or its agents, um, and how that compared to what had just happened to Kennedy. And he said, Patrice Lumumba died. Um, and his wife became a widow. Uh, his people had their leader cut down, and the U.S. government had been involved in doing that. And he went through a string of these, always winding up with the involvement of the United States government. So that the final point, that when you do those kinds of things all around the world, uh, you set up a situation, an atmosphere, an environment uh, in the world, and sooner or later, those chickens come home to roost. When he answered, I was really, I was really took 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 back. I could, I didn't understand that. And he answered the question. He said, "Well, I said I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a case of the chickens coming home to roost." Naturally, John Ali, the national secretary, was there. And that's how Mr. Muhammad got the news so fast. This statement is from Messenger Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Muslims of America. Uh, Minister Malcolm Shabazz is addressing a public meeting at Manhattan Center in New York City on Sunday, December the 1st, did not speak for the Muslims when he made comments on the death of the president, John F. Kennedy. He was speaking for himself and not Muslim in general. And Minister Malcolm has been suspended from public speaking for the time being. While the Nation of Islam publicly grieved for the slain president, the leadership announced the silencing of Malcolm X for 90 days. He was to give no speeches and to have no contact with the press. Well, we were doing a lot of Kennedy stories and there was going to be a little one talking about Malcolm having been suspended. And I was expecting, pick up the phone, I'd get a quote, and that would be it. In this case, he held me on the phone for longer than I had expected. And he sounded upset. He sounded worried. And it was the first time I had ever sensed vulnerability in this guy who I had always been accustomed to thinking of as an extremely strong man. Newspapers predicted a power struggle within the nation of Islam. It was later learned the FBI fed stories to local reporters in an attempt to deepen the rift between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. Uh, Gene, Gene, you were the, uh, I believe you were the only press fan in the, uh, in the auditorium when Malcolm X was shot. Yes, that's correct. I went as an individual. Is that how you happen to get in? Well, today's my day off, and uh, as a reporter, I'm naturally interested in current events. And this being the tense kind of situation in this part of town that it is, I decided that I would attend today, not as a reporter, but as a private citizen. Well, just what happened? You mean when Malcolm was shot, I assume? Exactly. I was sitting in the front row, the very right in front of Malcolm, uh, in fact, and uh, he came out on the stage. The uh, introductory speaker turned over the platform to him, and he raised his hand in uh, a Muslim greeting. So, Salaam Alaikum. At that point, uh, I, I heard a rumbling behind me. And I'm sure everyone else did too. And I turned around in my seat to, to see what it was. And uh, then we saw, like, I saw two guys standing up. And the next thing, my next impression, it all happened very rapidly, as you can understand, is of the gunshots. And uh, I saw Malcolm had his hand up. He had said, he said, stay cool, stay calm, or something like that. And uh, just then the gunfire went off and his, his hand was up. I remember this. I turned around quickly. And the next thing I saw was Malcolm falling back in a dead faint. Um, right after that, of course, like everybody else, you know, chairs were being knocked over. There were screams. Uh, everybody was in a mad confusion. 
I dove for the floor and scrambled behind a rampart on the side. My first impression was, of course, as a reporter, as you know, to get to a telephone and file my story. And I started crawling uh, towards the back of the auditorium, and, and uh, oh, I incidentally saw a guy running out, or evidently one of the perpetrators running out, and uh, he was shooting like a cowboy all over the place. And, of course, the, uh, the, the, the shots were going off wildly. And after that, there was, there was pandemonium. Today's Black History Month, FYI salutes the first black television journalist, Louis Lomax. He was born in segregated Georgia. He first reported for black newspapers, the Afro-American and the Chicago Defender. In 1958, he made history as the first black journalist on television. And a year later, he became the first person on TV to interview the legendary civil rights leader, Malcolm X, who would only sit down with Lomax. He went on to write several books, lectured on college campuses, and covered issues like the Vietnam War, the Black Panthers, and the women's movement. He leaves behind a proud legacy of groundbreaking journalism, and that's somebody you should know about.